So welcome to the insurance seminar. Um, oh wait, wrong room. <laughs> uh, so uh, I am Brian Samboden. I work for Redis. I'm a developer advocate. And today we're going to be talking about beautiful multi-model applications with my slides are not working. All right. <laughs> you see that little spinning thing? Yeah, that's that's not a good sign. All right, you know what? I'm going to talk and then I'll just do the demo. How about that? So we don't waste time. All right. So the uh, I'm going to memorize. I remember what I have in the slides. So the how many of you have used Redis before? Okay. All right. How many of you use Redis as more than a cache? All right, just a few hands, okay? So that's, that's the, the mission that I have at Redis. It's that everywhere that I go, even as a developer before, I used Redis. I did not know what Redis could do. I thought it was a cache. I thought it was like memcache, key value. You put something and then you ask for that something by that key. It made sense, it was in memory, it was really fast. Um, early on in my career, I'm like, well, you know, wh why do we need a cache? I mean, don't we have just a JVM and we have memory in there? We can put things in there and just get them out of there right next to the application. And, uh, and then I realized that there's much uh, more to a distributed cache than just your single VM. Um, but the cache, your cache, it's effectively your database for the most important things in your app. Uh, let's say that you have an e-commerce app and you have a shopping cart. And there are some things that you have to look up on the shopping cart. And uh, at some point, somebody's going to tell you, hey, uh, the response times, uh, we're losing customers. Uh, we can deal with this the way it is right now, maybe doing SQL queries to the database, um, or even doing some you know, in-home caching in your controller layer. So you decide to add a cache. And what happens typically? you degrade the complexity of the application to deal with the cache because most caches are simple key value engines. So the, uh, what Redis has done, it's extend that concept of key value to key and value being anything. Uh, anything as simple as a string, as medium complexity as a hash, or as full complexity as a full-blown graph. And that's what most people don't know about Redis, that you can basically have this universe of data structures that allows you to really uh, not compromise how your application has to work with the data in memory. Uh, the other thing that most people don't know is that when you say uh, Redis, they say, okay, you know, it's a cache. Uh, and if I, you know, plug in the cord or the data center gets hit by lightning, my data is gone. And that is not true. Uh, Redis, it's really, I'm not going to use the word cache anymore. Uh, Redis is a database. It just happens to be memory first rather than uh, memory last. And if you think about it, everything is memory first. And nowadays, that line between disk and memory is getting blurrier and blurrier with, with SSDs and all that stuff. Um, Therefore, I think that all databases are going to be memory first databases. Uh, the concept of a cache is just a feature of a database. And Redis is that, a full-blown NoSQL database with multiple model support uh, that can basically work really well as a cache. Unfortunately, we do uh, so well as a cache that we have been labeled just a cache. Uh, when I used to do a lot of Ruby and Rails applications, I had a deviation from Java in like 2011 or so, and I did a lot of Ruby and Rails applications, and everybody used Redis, and nobody knew what Redis was. There was one person that you know, kind of hooked up the system to basically do caching and pop sub. That was the only person that knew what Redis did. And then it seems that every time that you go and explore, you learn about all these really cool things that Redis can do. So let me see if I can actually kill my slides now. And if I can kill them, maybe I can show you just a few of them. Let's see. Um, for sports quit, sorry. When you're in, in front of an audience, then you get kind of this tunnel vision, you know? 
And I see my dead grandma floating in here saying, you can do this, Brian. It's okay. <laughs> oh, you see? Keynote, not responding. Damn you, Jobs. Okay. Oh, report it. Yeah, sure. That's going to help. <laughs> I'll just write there, et tu, keynote. <laughs> All right. Okay. So once again, beautiful multi-model applications with Redis stack. So I am BSB, Brian Samboden. Um, my name has a hyphen, so a lot of my friends said, we're not saying your last name ever again. You're BSB from now on. Uh, you can find me in, on Twitter and on GitHub there. That's me during the pandemic. That's basically, I live in the desert, so at least it's sunny all the time. So I could be outside drinking beer, putting some extra weight, you know, in case the, the apocalypse arrived. <laughs> so again, the premise of the session is that the cache is your database, then your cache should be a real database. In Redis, it's a real database. So it's Redis kind of a cache? No. It just happens to be a real database that happens to work really well as a cache. But caching is a function, not a property of the system itself. My good friend, Luis. So uh, Redis is that remote dictionary server. That's the Redis part of the name, remote dictionary server. Most people don't know that. Uh, in my mind, again, it's a memory, in memory first uh, database, optionally persistent. And it's, I think of it more as a remote data structure server. But this initials did not work well for marketing in terms of naming the product. I'll give you a second to think about it. And moving on. Okay. <laughs> so there's multiple uh, data types in Redis that can uh, allow you to basically manipulate any type of data that you need. Most of the you know, computer science 101 data types are available. So you have strings, bitmaps, bit fields, hashes. Hashes is probably the number one uh, data structure you use when you have an OO system, like a language like Java. Hashes map really well to objects. Until some news that I'm going to give you in a second. We have lists, sets, sorted sets, which have a, a weight to them. And uh, you have uh, geo indexes, uh, the funniest uh, name for a data structure, the hyper log log, uh, which is a deterministic data structure. Sorry, a probabilistic data structure. The other ones are deterministic. And streams. So if you have like, a, um, if you're trying to fight with Kafka right now and you want to just try something simple with streams, we have a stream data type in Redis. So this is what we call the open source Redis. What you get uh, from Redis out of the box when you download Redis from Redis IO. But wait, there's more. <laughs> uh, oh, did I mention that I work for Redis? Yeah. <laughs> So we have also an ecosystem of modules. And modules are C or ROS extensions that can add new data structures to Redis and new commands for those data structures. Uh, you can write your own if you have some crazy idea that uh, only your own data structure can fulfill. Uh, you can learn a little bit of Rust. Uh, it's better than C. And write your own. I've, I've, run, I've written a few modules just for fun. And uh, it's actually super simple once you learn Rust, which is not. But <laughs> so we have seven modules that are the BLESS modules uh, at Redis. Uh, but there's a list of modules out there, open source ones, probably numbering in the hundreds. Uh, you can find uh, AI engines, analytic engines, uh, pops up systems uh, with a lot of different uh, functionality. So there's, there's a very huge universe of modules. So we have uh, Redis JSON, which we're going to talk about today. We have Redis Search. We have uh, Redis Graph, which is basically like, uh, imagine a Redis key with a Neo4j graph as the value uh, with Cypher query language features and all that stuff, uh, but faster. <laughs> we have a time series, so if you have you know, let's say some system that's taking uh, readings from something over a period of time, uh, streams of uh, timestamp uh, elements can be used in Redis to, to do the type of time series analysis that you would do with those. Uh, we have an AI uh, module, which basically allows you to run PyTorch and TensorFlow models in Redis. 
and a lot of people ask me, it's like, why would you want to do that? Data locality. Imagine when you have to get a lot of data from somewhere to bring it to where the model is to run inferences. What it, most li likely, your data is going to be already in that in-memory accessible place. Therefore, send the model to the data and execute. There's also Redis Gears, which is uh, kind of like uh, Lambda functions on the cloud, but instead on Redis. So you can basically have uh, things that respond to, for example, key events in your systems. Some specific key has been added or removed, and then you can run some code in there uh, within a sandbox of safety. And uh, finally, we have Redis Bloom, which is some of those probabilistic data structures. And we're going to be uh, talking about that too. So we're going to cover today uh, JSON, Search, uh, and Bloom mostly. So there's also a packaging of five of those modules that you can download, in, uh, or you know, there's a Docker image for it. Or if you uh, use Redis Cloud, you can basically get a database that has all the modules already pre-configured. So you can use, uh, and what they've done in here is basically make sure that all the versions work together well. Uh, so there's interconnectivity between all those modules. And typically, search is kind of like the glue that basically binds all the different data types. So for Redis Stack, we have uh, JSON, search, graph, time series, and Bloom modules available. And you can get them from uh, that URL in there. And I will post the PDF of the slides uh, later today. So Redis loves Spring, uh, mostly because I love Spring. I've been a Java developer since 1997, and uh, now I'm working with Redis. And I figure, you know, put the peanut butter and the jelly that you love into a nice sandwich that I can actually consume every day. Uh, <laughs> Josh is a really good friend of mine too, so we hang out a lot. So we've basically been thinking about, you know, how to get uh, Redis and Spring working together uh, well. So. One of the things that we have is that um, there's a lot of commands for every data structure in Redis. And they are very low level. So for a Spring developer, you would have to use one of these drivers and basically do low level commands. So it's, it feels kind of like doing telnet in Java when you're doing basically basic commands to modify uh, or mutate a, a data structure. So we have two main drivers, JEDIS, a uh, horrible name in terms of basically being able to search for it. <laughs> um, and lettuce. Don't ask me. <laughs> so those are low-level uh, uh, drivers. And then we also have uh, module clients that are based on JEDIS that ha are, have been maintained by Redis uh, pretty much until now. And those are, um, let me make this a little bigger. Let's risk it. Oh, <laughs> all right. So those are uh, command-based but they uh, allowed you to basically tap into the commands for those specific modules. And then we have Spring Data Redis, which has been the first concerted effort to create something that it's spring level, family of spring data projects that basically deals with open source Redis. Uh, so since there was no module support in Spring Data Redis, some fool decided to basically create a little library that extended Spring Data Redis and added support for the modules. I'm the fool. <laughs> so uh, Redis Ohm uh, for object mapping uh, extends Spring Data Redis and basically brings all the Spring Data goodness uh, into the module usage in Redis. So basically, we have multi-object uh, mapping, multi-model object mapping and querying. So let's build something. That's what we're going to build today is a sample domain uh, mapped to Redis hashes, which is what Spring Data Redis does. But Spring Data Redis doesn't have search capabilities. They only have ba very basic secondary indexes. So we're going to add search to that. Uh, we're going to then uh, use uh, Spring Data repositories to basically search over those uh, hashes. We're going to create a JSON uh, model, too. So we're going to have a multi-model uh, Spring app that has JSON and hashes. We're also going to do more complex searching over those JSON documents. And if we have time, ITP, if, if time permits, um, we're going to do something uh, called entity streams, maybe look at the Bloom filters, and I'll show you some of the built-in like autocomplete features that we have in search. All right, so 
let me now switch to the demo. Okay, so empty repo. Uh, this is not Josh Long style of live coding. I don't have enough caffeine in me to be able to do it at that speed. So what I do is I replay uh, git commit with a, a Rust tool that I wrote. So I'm going to basically be doing that. So the first thing I'm going to do is basically pull a uh, Spring Initializer uh, sample app, which has nothing other than uh, web and dev tools. So if you look at, for example, the palm in here, I have my Spring Boot Starter uh, 270. And then I have, uh, let's see, what else do we have? It's Java 17, so Josh will be happy. And uh, we have the uh, Web Starter, DevTools, and Lombok. And yes, I like Lombok. <laughs> Until I can completely remove Lombok, I'm going to continue to like Lombok. I don't like the name, but I like the product. All right. Uh, so now the next. Uh, piece of information we're going to add in here is I'm adding Swagger. So Swagger is going to allow us to, uh, allow us to test this with a web UI um, to basically hit the services that we will build. And uh, if you can see here, I have the uh, Spring Fox uh, Swagger UI. And in our demo application, we have our Swagger annotations. Is that big enough font-wise? If somebody's suffering through the font size, just let me know and I'll crank it up. All right. So the first thing in real that I'm going to do, it's at the Redis Ohm um, Maven dependency. And that is right here. So as you can see, the library, it's in its infancy. Uh, the reason I wrote the library is that at doing demos with just the command base uh, utilities, was kind of embarrassing. <laughs> so I wanted to have uh, our modules feel like they belong in the Spring ecosystem. And this is kind of like the first level effort to get there. All right, so we have our dependencies. And then we're going to add a simple model. And it's going to be a role model. So imagine that you have you know, a, a user authentication system. You have users, and they have roles. So we have a simple class uh, role with an ID and a name. We're going to keep it simple to do this one. And I'm going to add Lombok, like basically Tabasco sauce or ketchup for Americans. <laughs> so I have the add data and add builder annotations. So I don't have to get getters and setters and all that stuff. And uh, then I'm going to add the Redis hash uh, annotation. And this is from Spring Data Redis, and it marks that object uh, to be serialized as a Redis hash uh, by repositories in, in, uh, in Spring. All right. We also need to mark one of the fields as an ID. So, so far, this is all Spring Data Redis uh, proper. Uh, remember that the library that I wrote just extends uh, Spring Data Redis. So now we need a repository. In the repository, let me expand this in here. So in, this is a Spring conference, so I'm assuming that most everybody has had to deal with a repository. Uh, and it's one of those things that it's magic for most people outside of uh, Spring. Um, so we have basically an interface that just by extending CRUD repository, we get all the CRUD functionality. And in uh, this system, we basically um, are creating a repository of roles where the primary keys are strings. Now, to be able to use the repositories, we have to add an annotation to our demo application. In that annotation, it's the enable Redis enhanced repositories. So if you use uh, Spring Data Redis before, you've used uh, the enable Redis repositories. So the enhanced part means basically we're adding search capabilities over those hashes. All right, and uh, since we're going to have a multi-model environment, or yeah, multi-model environment, I'm going to basically segregate the hashes and the JSON objects so the repository basically um, uh, processing doesn't get confused. So I have uh, base packages for my hashes that are going to be on repositories hashes, uh, the repositories and the models on models hashes. All right. 
So now we're going to load some test data. And um, I added a logger first so we can basically print some of the output of what we're doing. And then I'm going to add a command line runner. So my command line runner here, it's uh, just the, the skeleton of it. And we're going to basically add some code in there to load some roles. Uh, since, we, since we had a builder in there, we're going to be able to use the Lombok builder to build our objects. And uh, throughout this demo, what I'm doing is if the repository is empty, it, uh, it's not empty, means that I already have the data in there. If it's empty, then I'll do the job so we don't sit here waiting for data to load, at least you know, not more than once. So we have our little skeleton in there. And then I can create an object using the Lombok builder. Uh, so we'll just add three admin objects in there. Uh, sorry, three role objects, admin, customer, and editor. And I'm going to put them in a list. And then I'm going to uh, use the role repository, which notice that we are uh, using a constructor or a method injection in here to pass it to our method. And again, that's the, the beauty of Spring that basically will say, hey, you know, let's find that bean and serve it to you. I used to use uh, uh, auto injection, and then Josh will scream at me every single time. There's still a few auto injects in my code, uh, but he's not here, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> All right. So, um, and if we uh, already have the roles loaded, then we're just going to basically load them into that same list. All right. Now, to do searching over some of these objects, we're going to now add the magic that it's uh, extra to Spring Data Redis. So the first thing I'm doing in here, it's adding uh, the index annotation. And this is not the, uh, the traditional index annotation. This is a specific uh, index annotation from uh, Redis Ohm. And what that does, it creates a search index. Uh, if there's at least one index annotation or searchable annotation, it will create a search index for that class, so the role class will have a search index in Redis search, and the schema will contain that field. So every time that we create a new hash, that gets automatically indexed. It, it, uh, Redis search does automatic in the index maintenance. You don't have to do it yourself. Um, and then we should be able to do more complex finders to find some of the data that we're looking for. All right. so. In our repository now, I'm going to add a find first by name. And notice that that returns an optional role. So if we find it, uh, we're going to grab the first element that we find, and we're going to wrap it in an optional and give that to uh, the user. And uh, notice that, again, Spring, you just declare the method. And based on the method name, we basically construct a Redis search query under the covers to retrieve that data and do all the marshalling you know, from hashes to Java objects and vice versa. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, run the Spring Boot app. It should be uh, good enough to uh, run. And we should be able to see, uh, and I'll show you basically what's happening in uh, Redis in a second. But you can see that the uh, framework basically found one annotated uh, Redis hash bean. And uh, somewhere in here created some roles. And uh, let me scroll that so we can actually see output correctly. I don't know why it's wrapping like that. Uh, control B. Oh, yeah. So this was working just fine before this, but hey. <laughs> so read from, uh, from right to left. Uh, so created three roles in here. Uh, and uh, then there was a search method that executed. I'll show you the code for that in a second. But before we do that, let me show you uh, Redis Insight. So Redis Insight is kind of our data viewer IDE for Redis. And I'm going to refresh in here. Notice that we have a set of keys in there. And the keys that we have are uh, hashes. So if I click in here, there's going to be a set for all the primary keys of our um, application, of our roles. So these are the, the three primary keys of the three roles that we created. And, okay. and um, inside of this folder of um, roles. So the primary keys are the fully qualified name of the class, a colon, and then the primary uh, key, the primary ID. 
And as you can see, if I click on that, we see some of the hashes that we created. And when you click on the hash, you see that they have the ID and the name that we have in there. And there's also a meta field called underscore class that allows uh, Spring to basically know what type of object it's dealing with in case it gets it from a different, uh, uh, a, a different way or basically anonymized without the, the, the actual key. All right. So another thing I want to do here in Redis Insight, and notice that this is a Redis Insight that it's basically stack uh, customized, so it's showing me that I'm using Redis stack, and I have all the five modules that I mentioned before. So I'm going to start the profiler here, so the next time something happens against Redis, we can actually see what's going on. All right, so that is uh, the hashes. So let me show you now the code that we use for searching. So in our demo application, I added another uh, command line runner, and in there we use the role repository find by first name. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a command. Uh, I'm going to com command s, and this should basically restart the application. And if I go back to uh, Redis Insight, we should see what's happening against the database. And since we already stored the data, it's not redoing that part. We remember we have our little if. Uh, code in there, but you can see here that's an FT search command, and it's basically saying uh, FT search against the com Redis stack demo models hashes role index, passing the query name equals admin, and that's a syntax for a Redis search query. Uh, so basically what you're getting now, it's the same behavior as you had before with hashes, but rather than doing a slow lookup, it's basically using a real full-blown search engine to do all those searches. And obviously, that's the simplest of searches that you can possibly have against one field. We'll do something more complex next. All right. So the next thing we're going to do is add a, let me, uh, a user model. And our user model, I kind of, by the uh, magic of television, it has all this code in there already. So it's another Redis hash. Uh, I have my ID, but notice now we have more annotations because, you know, it's spring and annotations are free. <laughs> so uh, the searchable annotation, so before we use index, index basically creates what we call a tag search uh, field in the schema. Searchable creates a text uh, field in the schema, which is a full-blown uh, uh, search field. So you can do basically fuzzy searches, partial searches, uh, starts with, all that type of stuff. So this one, it's uh, uh, obviously it's more expensive to maintain uh, and to execute, but it's much more flexible. So if you have a chunk of text uh, and you want it to basically be able to search over the text, it's gonna tokenize, it's gonna stem, it's gonna do all the things that a search engine does against uh, a chunk of text. So we have the uh, searchable on the name, and notice that we also have, um, you know, you can, Obviously, we have nested objects uh, just like you have in most of the other uh, Spring Data projects. So we're going to, uh, I'm adding some code in here to basically add some of the roles that we created to the user objects. And that is down here, we're just going to initialize that hash set so we can put roles in there programmatically. And I'm also going to show you another feature of the, of the uh, framework, which is the ability uh, to have audit fields. So uh, a few of the Spring Data projects have audit fields. I added them to uh, the Redis uh, stack in here. So you can basically have a created uh, date and a last modified date for your object. So if you want to have audit uh, for your objects, that's part of the deal. So the uh, user repository, Again, very similar to what we had before. And now uh, in our code, I'm going to basically do the same thing that we did before, which is load uh, some of the users. So notice we have our little skeleton to load the users. And I'm bringing now um, the data that I'm going to be loading. So I actually have now a much, much more significant chunk of data. And that's under my resources, there should be a users.json. I'm not, not going to click on it because it's a big JSON file, and VS Code doesn't like big files like that. It just freaks out and, you know, kaputs. So 
Uh, just trust me, it's there. <laughs> And uh, I'm going to also add, uh, since I don't want to be recreating the filter uh, uh, or re, um, the bloom filter. Who knows what a bloom filter is? Okay. So imagine that you wanted to search over a billion uh, set of emails, okay, to find out if the email has been taken. If you do that against a relational database, it's going to be pretty expensive. Even if you do it against uh, a bunch of Redis hashes or a set, it's going to be extremely expensive. But a probabilistic data structure allows you to basically have a fixed space where that big chunk of emails, uh, it's indexed uh, to know whether it uh, has been taken or not. Uh, and the probabilistic part means that it can tell you for sure it hasn't been taken. Uh, so there's a margin of error that you can configure in there. But again, it's uh, fixed time fixed space. So if you have something that is very expensive, but you can tolerate a little bit of error every once in a while, uh, then a probabilistic data structure is for you. So what I'm doing in this case, uh, let me, uh, so what I'm doing in this case, it's on my email field, I added a bloom annotation. And that bloom annotation, it's basically saying, uh, give the repositories the ability to ask questions of that field against a Bloom filter, rather than basically using the database directly. Well, you're using the database because Redis is a database, but you're using a Bloom filter rather than the data structures. So it's always going to return in constant time, and it's all, always going to take constant space. Uh, you can miscalculate how much you need, and then you have to basically say, okay, you know, re recreate the index and make it bigger. But that typically doesn't happen very often. And this is the tolerance of basically how sure I need to be about something being in there or not. All right, so um, if we look at Redis Insight now, you can see that a bloom filter, and that's kind of small, isn't it? I thought you guys had eagle eyes. All right, so uh, in here, notice that it added a bloom filter uh, for that company email. Uh, and every time that we add an object, uh, it basically, um, it, it, it will index that into the Bloom filter. And let me show you the code that's actually now using the Bloom filter. So if we look at the uh, Spring Boot output, uh, let's see, where is this? Okay. So on my demo application, let's see, did I do that already? Uh, no, I haven't. Okay, so never mind. Uh, I'll show you that in a second. I haven't gotten to that commit yet. So I'm adding a, a few finders to the repository here just to do a little more complex searching, and then we'll do the bloom filter at the end of that. Now I remember. So I'm, I'm going to add a find by name starting with, and then I am going to add the index annotation to the user email. And this is going to force me actually to have to uh, drop my index at some point. But we'll test it first and see how it goes. All right, so um, let's see where we are. So notice I have now a test for my find by name starting with, which is a, uh, a mo more complex uh, search uh, pattern that you could do with traditional Spring Data Redis. So now, let's see what the output looks like. I might, yeah, so let me maximize this. And as you can see, we did a search for the partial uh, string MIC, and it returned the users for uh, Michael Young, Michael Olson, Michael Sims, and Michael Dixon. Um, so, I mean, you can do very complex searches if you need to with, um, with Reddit search. All right, so let's see. Okay, so, oh yeah, see, here's my note. Do drop the index. <laughs> so if you look at the user object, notice that now we have a field for, for our email has the bloom filter and it has the index annotation. 
And if we look at the repository now, we have another finder, find first by email. And if we test the find first by email, uh, let's see if we are, okay, so notice that that actually blew up because I'm changing the schema on the fly. And one of the things that we don't do is destroy the index that you already created. So if you want to recreate the index, we ask you to manually delete it uh, so you can add changes to the schema. There's no schema migration for indexes as of this time. Um, so I'm gonna go to Redis CLI here, just so I can do it fast in here. And I'm going to basically list uh, the indexes that I have. And notice that I have uh, two indexes, one called user index and the role index. So I'm gonna go ahead and do an FT drop index for that uh, index. And then simply by just resaving this, I should get things going in here. Oh, didn't pick up, okay, let me just. Sometimes the uh, build tools do not detect the changes if I haven't really changed anything, so. Um, oh yeah, Brian broke something. Ah, this is the uh, part where I start sweating, okay. <laughs> So let's see, what, what did I do, what did I do? Um, I killed the index, let me see where we are. Actually set my first object. Um, okay, I'm 36. All right, let's see. Uh, don't you love this part when somebody breaks their code live? Okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to I'm going to move ahead a little bit. Actually, I'm gonna do something drastic. Okay, so now let me just restart everything. And based on time, I know that this is the right thing to do. <laughs> so I'm going to, uh, so now basically I should be reloading everything. So I reloaded everything, our roles, uh, but now I loaded a thousand users, those were the ones in the JSON file. And I also created six fictional characters. I'm gonna show you that code in a second here. So let me. Uh, all right, so in the, uh, in the main code, uh, the first thing that I did is um, created the users like we had before. I read them from that JSON file and I used the repository to save them to, uh, to the database. And, uh, and that, that resulted in a thousand users uh, that was all generated data from, uh, I believe, userdata.com or one of those fake data generators. And then I'm creating a bunch of different fictional characters. And uh, those are all Marvel characters, as you can see. They all have a saying that I stole from one of the, basically, scripts of the movies, so we can do some searches over that text. So I have a, uh, six characters from those movies, and we have addresses in here uh, for each one of the characters. And then we're building, uh, for each one of the characters, a fictional character object. Uh, and they have a first name, last name, uh, all that data, and they were saving them all to the database. So let me show you what those look like. Um, so that is under my uh, JSON. So these are gonna be JSON objects. So my fictional characters, uh, sorry, here. So my fictional character models are uh, a different type of object. So these are at, have an at document annotation. And what that means is instead of a hash, we're going to create a JSON document for it. Uh, notice that the same patterns that you see in Spring Data Redis uh, or any Spring Data project apply. I have a, an ID, I have index fields. Uh, you can index the ID if you want to. In, there we go. 
and uh, you basically can do better types of searches over your IDs, other than just search by ID. And I have uh, an index field for first name, last name, uh, the age of the actor, so you can index numeric fields. You can index, uh, uh, in here I have that chunk of text, that quote, it's a searchable, so we can do full text searches over that one. And you can also do uh, geo filtering or geo searches. This is a um, spring data point class, which is uh, a geo point class. And just by putting the index annotation, so the index annotation will look at the data type and figure out the right type of uh, schema field to create. So now you can do uh, lat long searches. And you can also do searches over nested objects. So for example, in this case, the fictional character has an address and we can say, find um, a fictional character by the street name of their address. And we also can do searches over sets. So in this one, we have a set of skills and uh, those you can search over, uh, just like you would search over any set. Uh, does it contain this element? Does it contain all the elements, et cetera? So let me show you what the data looks like. So in here, notice that we have our fictional characters. They have names, ages. Uh, there's the lat long information for each one of them. Uh, and then the set of um, skills. Uh, I wasn't very creative with the skills. So Thor, one of his skills, it's he owns a hammer. Uh, biceps, hair, and heart. I mean, the guy has it going, so. <laughs> uh, and then we have, you know, a bunch of different uh, strings that basically are uh, skills for those characters. So now, let's actually switch to uh, the repository first so you can see what the search queries look like. And that's actually the more uh, interesting part of this. So if I go to the uh, fictional character repository and maximize that, now these are the, the type of uh, searches you can do. You can say, for example, I want to get a list of fictional characters uh, where I find uh, the actors between certain uh, age ranges. And just by declaring the, the, uh, the predicates uh, using the between predicate and then the name of the field, so the name of the field is actor age, uh, finders start with find by. You can basically do a range, uh, a range search. You can also find by multiple properties. So you can say uh, find by actor first name and last, uh, last name. Uh, you can find, uh, this is the geolocation search. So you can say find a actor, find by actor location near. So the predicate here will be near. Uh, you pass a point and a distance to do a radius over that point and uh, you can do uh, a search like that. We also have, uh, for the full text searches, rather than using find by, you use the keyword search. So you can say search by quote, and then just pass free text. Uh, you can also pass uh, uh, characters in there, like an asterisk uh, or different control characters to basically customize the, the fussiness of your search. And this one, it's the example that I was talking about, a nested object. Uh, in spring data, the, the, the pattern is that to go into a nested object, you use an underscore. So in here, we're basically doing a find by actor address, and there's a city field in the address, and that's how we get to it. And uh, here's one, find by skills, and find by skills containing all of this uh, set. So a lot of flexibility to basically do searches. So let me go now to, um, not this, not this, this. So we're going to go now to uh, Swagger. Man, how many things did I break today? I'm telling you. Oh, did I start the application? Yeah, I, th I thought I did. Did I break it again? I don't know what's going on. Uh, let's see. All right, give me one second. We're almost out of seconds, aren't we? Okay. I'm going to do something drastic. I'm going to clear everything. There. And then, oh. Okay. I'm going to 
exit. Let me properly exit this to make sure that I have my application back to. good all right well the demo gods were in very friendly with me today but hey <laughs> okay so I'm just reloading everything right now again uh, actually this will be a good time to see basically so you can watch with the monitor on what's going on against the database so in this case you're seeing all those users being loaded again um, since I ran out of options of what to do to fix it at the last second. <laughs> um, but this is actually very useful when you're trying to debug your, uh, your application, being able to see the specific commands that are being issued against Redis. And sometimes it's very easy to basically find out that you're doing like a, an N plus one uh, pattern uh, without knowing. And this is the place where you see like, oh my God, what's going on, on uh, against the database? Uh, or even if you're using some of the simple caching patterns in, uh, in Spring, it's very easy to see if uh, you're misusing uh, Redis as a cache. All right, so this uh, should be finished in uh, about time for us to basically see that demo. So, so we're good. So uh, the moral of the story is that Redis can do a lot of things um, that you didn't know it could do. Uh, it will do them in memory, it will do them very fast, and you don't have to compromise your application layer to talk to a simple caching solution. You can basically use a real database uh, to do the things that a real database can do. The other moral of the story is don't load so much data when you're doing live demos. <laughs> All right, so let me go to the slides for a second here. So. Um, Notice that I was loading data manually with code. That is a bad idea. It's just to demonstrate how to use the repositories to load data. We have a really cool tool called Riot that can basically bulk load JSON and hashes and serialize from Redis down to files and vice versa. And it's called Riot. You can find it at that uh, URL. In uh, Riot, it's created by uh, Julian, uh, which is a coworker. Um, and uh, he does an amazing job uh, creating open source for Redis. Oh, yeah. It was supposed to be sound for that. So all the cap code can be found uh, under that URL on, on my GitHub repo. And I will post these slides uh, for everybody to basically use them. Uh, all of my code is available there. We also have uh, the library, it's Redis Ohm Spring, which is under the Redis GitHub uh, organization. We have uh, all the modules. So there's the Redis modules hub. It's basically like a directory where you can see all the different modules available. Uh, if it's not one of the ones that we package with Redis, uh, installing the modules is pretty easy. Uh, in most cases, it's just an SO file that you basically put in, a, in the right directory in your Redis install. And once you launch it, you can basically do a modules list and you'll see the, the modules that have been loaded. Uh, let me show you that actually on here. So I can go here, let me maximize this. I'm on the Redis CLI, just running inside of VS Code. So I can say, um, I believe it's just modules, modules, modules list, no, module list. Yeah, so in here, um, notice that I basically listed all of the modules that are installed. So I have JSON, time series, graph, uh, search in uh, BF, which is Bloom filter. So notice that there's an SO file. So that's typically going to be how you're going to find a module as an SO file and you just plop it into your Redis install and you know, you're good to go. And uh, there's a whole amazing variety of modules out there. Okay. Uh, you can also do all of this without messing with your local environment. So uh, Redis Cloud has an option to basically say, I'm going to use a Redis stack database. It will give you all the five modules uh, in a connection string, and then you're good to go. Um, if you can use that code, 
uh, I, I don't know, I think I get free cookies in the mail from the company or something, I don't know. But <laughs> use that code to basically uh, get a, a, a free account. I, I, I don't know how long, I think it's a 30, 30 days free. Some of my Redis coworkers can probably know better you know, how, what the period is. But yeah, you get uh, $200 uh, worth of credits for that. And uh, we also have a developer site that uh, we maintain, which where, where we have a lot of little articles about how to play with all the different modules and use cases uh, for time series, graph databases, you know, fraud detection, all the different things that you can do with the different type of modules. Uh, we also have Redis University, where we can basically show you how to use different parts of Redis efficiently, and, uh, and you get a nice certificate that you can put on LinkedIn. <laughs> And uh, that's, uh, hey, we have one minute to go. Yay. <laughs> um, any questions? Yes. Oh, thank you. So uh, now I understand that Redis is a full-fledged database that you can do a lot of stuff with it. But uh, I'm still not sure why, uh, what are the advantages of using Redis over a conventional uh, uh, sector? So the number one thing that, uh, that convinces people to use Redis is the performance. So Redis uh, will beat the pants speed-wise of most other systems out there. Uh, that's one of the things that surprised me when I first used Redis. I, at first, I thought, oh, this is a pretty simple system. And, uh, and then I started, you know, obviously, you go from using something like MySQL, uh, and then you put Redis in between MySQL and your application, and you're like, oh, wow. And, and we think about caching as kind of like a Band-Aid for something that might be subpar in our application. Uh, but then, then in my mind, I go to, well, that is actually a database. So... Why do I need that other thing back here? <laughs> uh, and again, we're all used to basically SQL as the lingua franca of connecting data together. Uh, but with my, my premise here too, it's that a NoSQL database and a powerful search engine, it's almost the same as a SQL database. So that is, it's, a, it's a different way of thinking about the data. Uh, it's, it's a more of a, a, a data structure uh, approach to data then everything looks the same. And I'm not saying that you have to throw your relational database out the door because, again, they're being used in tandem with something like Redis you know, for the last you know, 40 years. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a, I, I've seen applications where Redis, it's taking a big chunk of uh, operations in terms of maybe having a graph in there that's doing something uh, complex to detect fraud, fraud in, in shopping carts or something like that or abuse of coupons or things like that. And then you still have your relational database as your operational data. Uh, sometimes now uh, you're seeing a NoSQL database as your operational data uh, with offloads to a relational database for analytics uh, later down the, the line. So I, I don't think that now uh, one has to come before the other. They can work together or one can be in front of the other uh, and vice versa. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Questions? Uh, thank you. Uh, just uh, a quick thing, uh, just uh, concerning this, uh, if, if you want to use it as a real database for uh, just importing data, uh, my concern is uh, mostly about some uh, features that, for example, for backup, restore, and something that we really need to uh, uh, maintain the data. I, it is, uh, is it something uh, for now is developed for, for this, uh, if you use this uh, Redis as a real data for storing the data for the customers, yes. for example? Yeah, so Redis has uh, persistence mechanisms, and there's two different persistence mechanisms. And it's kind of like uh, if you see in databases like Cassandra and a lot of the NoSQL databases, they keep a, a, a log of what's going on in memory, and then they offload that log as a binary blob of sorts to disk. And then if everything comes crashing down, uh, what, what you basically get is that binary and then the, 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 let's think of it as a text log replayed on top of the binary and now you have recreated the in-memory image that was there before a crash. Given Redis rarely crashes. <laughs> uh, but yeah, there's persistence uh, in, uh, 
for example, on Redis Cloud or Enterprise Redis, you have distributed persistence of, of Redis. So it's, uh, it's pretty much the same as any other database. And there's tools to basically audit uh, the health of the data and to get data in and out of the database. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Anybody else? All right, well, thank you very much. Oh, go ahead. <laughs>